Hello, welcome. My name is Marisol Ornelas and I'm the Associate Director of Enrollment Management. And we thank you for joining us tonight. We are so excited to welcome you all to spend the next 45 minutes or so together. This is our second virtual webinar of a series that will focus on specific highlights to our upper school program. We invite your family to ask questions throughout the event using the Q&A feature. After our presentation, we will leave time for questions and answers. Tonight we are joined by Mike Peller, the head of the Upper School of Hillbrook, and Annie Makala, the director of the Scott Center of Entrepreneurship. To begin, I would like to invite Mike Peller, the head of, the, of Hillbrook Upper School, for a few welcome remarks. Thanks, Marisol, um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We are so excited to give you some insight into one of our signature programs, the Immersives. In the last webinar, we gave an overview of our academic program, uh, but now we wanna share um, what the, the way in which we started our school year with three weeks of students diving deeply into an interdisciplinary course. Uh, at the Hillbrook School, at the high school, we are asking kids to grapple with key questions. We're asking them to grapple with the questions of um, what matters to you and what are you doing about it? And in this, the learning is both deeply relevant and purposeful, and kids are finding meaning uh, as they tackle challenging work. Um, as we think, of, as we thought about how to share this experience with you, we thought no better way than to have our students give insight um, to hear directly from our students. But first, I want to welcome up our director of the Scott Center for Social Entrepreneurship, Annie Makala. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be with you tonight. Um, you know, I shared with Mike last year this kind of learning, this kind of education is something we've been studying at the Scott Center and um, in education in general for more than a decade. And we're so excited to have seen it come to life. Immersives are the opportunity to use the city and our world as our classroom, to hear about complex things through lots of different perspectives of people that are working on these challenges every day, and then to center youth voice in the conversation about seeing the world as we as it is, imagining what it could be, and partnering with our community to make a difference. Um, so you're going to get to hear from three amazing students, all of whom were part of um, a different immersive course. So we, we had three different immersive courses. Students all chose which one they wanted to be part of. We had art as activism, civics in action, and the study of water. So I'm going to welcome up our three amazing students, Jackson, Addie, and Caperton. Hello, thanks for being here, you all. Um, will you start by introducing yourself with your name, the school you were at before Hillbrook Upper School, why you chose to join the founding class of Hillbrook Upper School, what immersive you were in, and a highlight. And I'll help, um, I'll help remind you of those questions as we go along. But Caperton, will you kick us off? Hi, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Caperton. Um, I went to the girls' middle school, and... Um, I chose Hillbrook because of their um, city as a classroom uh, idea, and I um, I thought that was really cool, like getting to know the city of San Jose and uh, kind of like embrace it. And uh, I was in Civics in Action, and uh, a highlight of that would be 
um, like just getting to meet with people in general, like a whole a whole bunch of important people in our city, uh, and somebody like specific would be Betty Young, who is Cindy Chavez's chief of staff, uh, and I like I found um, she's absolutely amazing. Look her up, people, because um, like I said, she's amazing. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Caperton Jackson. Will you jump in? Uh, yeah, so my name is Jackson Rose. Um, I went to Synapse School. Um, it's in Redwood City. Um, yeah, so one key reason why I chose Hillbrook was their uh, social entrepreneurship um, kind of focus, um, giving a shout out to Annie. Um, yeah, so I thought that was a really, really, it, it kind of aligned with most of my key beliefs in terms of like, understanding how to learn and classroom environment in general. Um, and what, what was my, um, what was my immersive? So I was in the water engineered and natural flows, uh, immersive. So my highlight was probably meeting, uh, Jamie G workman. If you don't know who that is, he's the author of uh, heart of dryness. Um, also, if you've not read this book, it is fantastic. Um, he was super, super interesting. Um, and I recommend looking him up after uh, if you can. Awesome, thanks so much, Jackson. I'm actually gonna put a link to that book in our comments so people can find it easily. Addie, will you jump in? Yeah, so I'm Addie. Um, I have gone to Hillbrook since fourth grade. So I'm just continuing on to the high school. And one reason that I chose to go to Hillbrook High was because I really wanted to have that like unique experience of being able to build a high school. It sounded really fun. Um, the immersive that I was in was artist activism. And one main highlight for me was meeting with um, some people at Local Color and hearing how they are connecting like local artists and like connecting the whole city with art and by like adding color to the city. And one thing that matters to me is climate change. And during my immersive, and as we were walking around downtown San Jose and looking at murals, I noticed that I didn't see any murals or any art really about climate change. And so for my final project, me and my group made a documentary about the connection between art and climate change. My name is Addie. My name is Gigi. My name is Millie. We are ninth graders going to school in downtown San Jose, and an issue that matters to us is climate change. Our three immersive was about art as activism, and as we were walking around San Jose, we got to see so many incredible people make art about what matters to them. We saw many murals, but noticed that none of them were about climate change. That is why it's crucial for us to touch on this topic in San Jose. We asked some people why they thought climate change matters in San Jose. Important for us to be looking at climate change and specifically in San Jose to understand what are the impacts and what will be the impacts of climate change. So our role as you know, coming from a place of equity, we need to ensure that everyone has access to the same degree of climate resilience uh, so that we can take care of every, every single member of our city. According to S dgs.un.org target 13.2 for climate change global temperatures have already hit 1.1 degrees celsius rising due to the increasing global greenhouse gas emissions reached recording highs in 2021 kids also feel it. They get cold throughout the year now and it's very uncommon. Um, and they just feel like it's affecting our animals, our nature. It's just something that I feel like is unfortunate. We need to do better as like a society to bring our environment to better things. Climate change is now. We're seeing the impact and effects now. Rises in temperature, fires, devastating earthquakes. We're seeing climate change impacts you know, all over the world. In San Jose, it's gonna impact jobs. I mean, if you do a pan out of all of the spaces that are here, um, it's 
going to impact um, how we travel. It's going to impact um, especially people that are vulnerable, that don't have access to air conditioning. There was a heat wave last year that rocked this area and I had to travel from Redwood City to all these different Home Depots to try to find one unit for our family because we didn't have AC. San Jose already has a lot of art. So why can't we use this as an opportunity to change other issues and add more color to the city? One of the articles I read was called Artivism, or Art's Utility in Activism, about how the experience of art is transformative and can change our minds. If we used art to tell people about climate change, then we can get people to want to make a change. In addition to reading that, I also read an article called Art Making for Political Ecology. Practice, Poetics, and Activism Through Enchantment. This article stated how living conditions are dwindling and resources for us to survive. They prove our point in saying that art can help our world and why we need to act on climate change. We agree that it is important to do something about climate change right now. In addition, San Jose is the 12th biggest city in the country, home to many different cultures and residents. Keeping our planet clean is crucial to the people of San Jose. Our first step to making a mural in San Jose about climate change would be to sketch an idea based on these murals in other countries and cities around the world. Then we could get help from our teachers and local muralists to implement this concept. In conclusion, we think that climate change is a huge problem in our world and that if we talked about this issue more in San Jose and if we used art as activism, then we could get more people to know about this issue. I, I'm, I'm truly blown away at what our students were able to do, what our students were able to do in just three weeks in a course, in their first three weeks in high school, in the first three weeks of our high school as founding students. Our students were grappling with truly meaningful questions. We are creating a high school that is both student-centered and community-based, a school environment that is both joyful and challenging that is supportive and demanding, a school that is progressive and purposeful. We're creating a school that all students deserve. And I mention this because too many schools are, are stuck in a hundred year old version, uh, a model grounded in the industrial revolution. So let me let me talk a little bit about that. There's a, there's a searing critique of education that came out of a New York Times op-ed uh, that said, if you took someone from New York City in the early 1900s, and so this is Times Square, and if you took that person from the early 1900s and then you plopped them in today in the same place, they wouldn't know what to make of it. All of the cars rushing by, um, some of them don't even have drivers anymore, people stuck to their phones, industries that didn't, exist are now prolific everywhere, people would not know what to make of it until you put them in a classroom. And as soon as you set them in a classroom, most classrooms, not our classroom, but most classrooms around the world, the person would say like, ah, this feels familiar. It's students in rows with the teacher in front. Um, and, and this idea of teacher as sage on the stage, just saying, learn this content and students trying to mimic it back. But we know that our students deserve better. They need to grapple with challenging, complex problems, the types of work that they're gonna face when they, when they leave school. We also know that students are capable of doing great work now as high school students if we create the conditions, give them the support and the time and the resources. And we saw that in our immersives. But going back to sort of traditional schooling, this is, um, this is some research done by uh, um, a group that was exploring question asking tendencies. And what you can see is that um, there are two, uh, there are three, three skills that, that uh, the researchers were looking at from students from age zero to 18, um, their ability to, to read and write and question ask. Um, and early on, um, you see this spike in question asking when kids are like three or four years old. And for anyone that has been around a three or four year old, you would, you would understand this. They're asked, why is this? How is that? Um, they're wired to learn. Humans are wired to learn. But around five years old, there's this precipitous drop in the question asking skill as the other skills go up. And the critique 
Um, or And while this is not causal, the critique here is that schools teach us no longer to ask questions. The, the sort of the system of school is meant to show that students that have the right answers are quote unquote smart and the students that are asking questions are not. But we know that questions are the things that unlock new ideas. Questions and creativity are the things that we need to harness. Um, and we also know that sort of traditional measures of, 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 of looking, at, um, looking at how to measure sort of uh, intelligence in schools, the typical traditional methods of assessment are, are causing a mental health crisis in the school. And instead, we need to engage students in learning that matters to them and that they can do something about that. And when we do that, learning is both more engaging um, it's more transferable. They can move it from one space to the next. And it's more durable, which means they can remember it longer. Um, and also, we know that when learning is um, is is driven by these questions around purpose, uh, that, it, that it inspires hope in our students, which pushes back against a mental health crisis that is plaguing students in schools around the country. And it's because of that that we built our academic program, the high school program. And it's because of that that one of our signature programs is these immersives and no one better to talk about it than our director, Annie Macla. Awesome, thanks so much, Mike. Um, as we shared earlier and as you got a glimpse into with students, we believe deeply that the power of youth voice does not need to sit on the outskirts of what's happening in their own communities. And this idea of understanding the world as it is, which is full of complexity, beautiful complexity and really challenging complexity. And when we're able to hold both of those things as true, we are doing incredible work to build not only our own individual agency, but we're also helping students understand that no single issue is going to be solved by an individual. The thing that I love so much about social impact learning and entrepreneurship is that it is impossible to do it well alone. And while you might do pieces really well on your own, and that time is important as part of our immersives experience, every student is doing individual homework and project assignments each evening. We use this incredible tool called Unruler to document the learning throughout the whole three week process. And so students are having an individual experience and yet they're also challenged every day to come to school and to class and bring the things that they've been grappling with, bring their ideas, bring their overnight mail to a, a group not only of students, but a group of faculty and a group of community partners. Throughout the three weeks, we had more than 50 community partners help shape, influence, inspire our students. And these are people that are working right here in San Jose every single day on the topics that we are researching and learning about. So the information is real time. It's not something that was written for a textbook published 20 years ago. You know, as Jackson mentioned, learning about water, you need to be up to date on the data that's happening with water right here in our community. We all know water is going to be a complex topic that all of our students are going to have to understand and engage deeply in. And so to feel like you can use that antidote to anxiety, which is agency. And agency is at the core of our social impact learning programs, both the local experiences, and then we also have spring immersives, which takes takes our students to domestic and international locations um, to apply that same kind of community-based, place-based learning um, in a new context. So as you see, these are two different three-week courses. Combined, they make a six-week course. Um, students have a lot of agency in helping shape them along the way, and they are interdisciplinarily taught. So an English teacher is partnering with a design teacher who's partnering with a science teacher. It is the most incredible kind of curriculum development, collaborative teaching I've ever experienced. And watching teachers sit alongside students and really work as coaches and co-conspirators is, is one of the best things I think school can be doing. Um, the other exciting thing about immersives is that as we begin to talk more and more to the community, our students are building an equity and impact literacy. They're able to refer to things such as the sustainable development goals. And as you start listening to leaders from around the world talk, that acronym SDG will be something that you hear about. You might hear about it at the dinner table from your own child, 
But you also will then start hearing the patterns of the way equity and impact literacy is a core part of just being in community, learning in community, leading in community. At the Scott Center, we have built um, what we call impact academics. And this is seven years of research alongside both K-12 educators, um, but also a lot of collaborators from higher education. You might have known or, or experienced the model of a January term or a June term course in higher education, that idea that you can dive deep on a complex topic and apply lenses such as finance, system thinking, storytelling, design as core parts of your learning. What we believe is that these are concepts that are not going to live within single disciplinary courses, that they are lenses to apply across your learning, and they are critical life skills that we need to give learners in K-12 education space to explore, space to build that skill. Only 14 schools in California have formal financial education courses. That is a skill that we know influence long-term social change and the ability to live with this idea that finance will be a core pillar of how you understand long-term change is really exciting. And when students see these tools as ways that they can understand not only their own individual contributions to the world, but also the way they can highlight and amplify other people's contributions to the world, that to me is the kind of intellectual learning that is so exciting about immersives. We also see this as a way that we can amplify other core kinds of classes that students really love. So robotics is going to be a core part of our education at the upper school. And that challenge, that additional challenge to say, let's build really great robotic skills. And then we're gonna challenge you to use those skills to do something in the world. And you, we're not gonna tell you which problem you need to solve or what kind of social impact you need to follow. We're going to give you the space to say what matters to you. What do you want to do about it? And this incredible toolbox to find the thing that you want to contribute in that moment. And our hope is that throughout the four years of upper school, you don't stick with just one thing. You have this kind of plethora of experiences. And by the time you're graduating in senior year, you've had enough experience with all these different kinds of lenses, whether it's Python coding, custom fabrication, human-centered design, or the social entrepreneurship program to really feel confident and excited about the contributions you want to continue to bring to the world and the skills that you want to continue to grow. As I mentioned earlier, you know, oftentimes when we're talking to other schools and other colleagues, they're frustrated by this idea that you can learn something through a 30 minute interview with someone or a single day field trip. And that the concepts that we're really trying to understand require both a local and a global mindset. And this is specifically why we believe so deeply in using the sustainable development goals as a literacy and as a place to say, look, you don't have to be responsible for all 17 of these. And in fact, your interests might change year after year but being aware of the ways in which we're talking about social impact and social change and being able to recognize the intersectionality of this work is a critical part of being an intellectual leader and learner. So these social impact one is the introduction and it's a really fun way to kick off the school year because right off the bat, we are in the community. We walked more than 50 miles total throughout the three immersives. We met, as I mentioned, more than 50 social impact leaders right here in San Jose, many of whom are staying involved in our high school, are so excited about a school model where kids are really diving deep into complex problems. And instead of it being a presentation to kids, it was a conversation with committed individuals. That's what one social impact leader that joined the Civics in Action group shared with me. And she was like, oh, I came in with 50 slides and I thought I would talk the whole time. And these students owned the whole conversation. They had better questions than I'm asked the majority of press conferences that I do. They understood that there isn't single answers to these complex problems. And they were deeply curious about what we as a collective community can do to make change. 
So as we mentioned, we have these three individual courses and students opt into those courses, but we also believe deeply that there is specific group of skills that we want all students to have equally. So these four skill pathways were our way of building this routine of learning while also holding true to these rituals of learning. And the routine of learning was that we knew all students would have a data analysis skill set the opportunity to learn from incredible people building AI. So as most schools scrambled to understand what to do with AI, we were joined by the CTO of Microsoft along with other AI experts to not tell us how to use it, but to create space for students to say, this is how I imagine using it. Here are all the problems. Go back to your office, make it better for us because we ultimately are going to be the ones on the receiving end of artificial intelligence. And as one student shared with the CTO of Microsoft that day in class, AI needs to be ethical. It needs to be ethical for artists, it needs to be ethical for students. And it was this incredible conversation that went way beyond the majority of conversations I'm witnessing happening around AI and education. And it wasn't just that like, this is the automatic thing to do. It was a complex, thoughtful, characterization of a new tool that students were putting in their toolbox to be able to do this great work. Many of the documentaries and the TED Talks used AI to do that imagining of the future work that we believe is so important. And so it was a simple part of the long-term experience. Um, and it was, a, it was a part of a skill that all students had access to. Ilsa Doman, our Director of Teaching and Learning, taught a course in research and students went to San Jose State MLK Library and really understood that research is going to be what roots us in our understanding of the way things are and have been. And then the social impact course that I taught was about that ability to imagine what they could be. This marrying of these four things are really an exciting complexity. Um, and we love the fact that students have this unifying skill pathway experience and have the opportunity to use those skills and apply them deep into a topic that they have chosen over three weeks to understand at an even deeper level. As I mentioned earlier in the comments, there is a culmination of learning, the showcase for learning, which happened at Create TV, an incredible partner to us um, where students shared either in small groups a TED style talk or a mini documentary. This was their opportunity after a short learning sprint to not only explore the topic with a new audience, but to make some claims and have to defend those claims and to imagine alongside people um, that have been really curious about their learning. It was for me, one of the highlights of my teaching career, watching students stand up and have really thoughtful reflections about these topics. As one, one student shared, you know, art isn't as a universal language, whether you can communicate or with words or not, is a complexity in a city in which over 26 languages are spoken on a regular basis, but art is a language that all people can speak together. And I thought that was such a poignant way of understanding why this kind of learning matters. We had students imagining a future for Hillbrook in 50 years. One of the questions Mike and I asked students on a podcast was, you know, when you come back to this city in 50 years, what will you be excited to see Hillbrook doing? Who do you want to hire in your future work? And students had incredible answers. One student wanted to launch a Hillbrook housing initiative because he was so moved by all of the work that um, community members are doing to try to solve this complex problem of homelessness and houselessness. And so he had a whole vision of what, it, what is a community center that puts dignity at the center of the work look like? Now, of course, we're likely not going to build this housing initiative in the next four years, but it planted a seed and it got us thinking creatively and thoughtfully about the kind of city that we want to be part of shaping. So this was our showcase and it was one of our first ways of sharing our work with the San Jose community. The buzz was so real. You could barely get in the door. There were so many people so excited to hear our students. Um, and that's the power 
of doing education in this way. Next up, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask Marisol to tee up a video that we are sharing with you because if you are interested in seeing this kind of learning at a at a deeper level. Um, alongside many of our community members at the Scott Center. We're hosting an event on November 3rd. We'd love for you to come as our guest. Um, this event is really with the goal of understanding all sorts of different complexities around our city and hearing through the perspective of lots of different leaders. So the founder of Bay FC, the women's first women's professional soccer team, Allie Wagner, is not only a Hilbert graduate, but she is also um, now a parent at the school. And she's going to speak to this idea of being athlete to entrepreneur and how important it is to really understand that entrepreneurship is a tool that's applied across all industries. We can all be entrepreneurial, little e, in our thinking and in our work. Um, and this is really exciting. As Addie is reminding me too, the show choir will be singing at this event. The Scott Center Student Club will be presenting. You'll get to hear from a lot of different students. You'll also get to see how we use Dolly 2 in our early work at the Scott Center um, as a tool for social change and imagining the future. So Marisol, will you tee up that, that minute long video and get these folks excited about joining us on November 3rd? I was muted. Um, we we want to, I was saying, this is an incredibly excited time to be at the Hillbrook School. Uh, and and we hope that you're you're feeling that and getting a sense of it uh, and interested in learning more. And um, we do want to share just one more video with you that was created by a group of four, a group of four that Caperton, one of our uh, students was a part of, um, that was uh, that was in the civics in action uh, class. Uh, and they are looking, they were specifically looking at diversity in politics. Um, and after this video, uh, we're going to invite a parent up to share a little bit about their experience as a parent who is also working as a mentor on this project. Uh, but for now, let's watch this video and then we'll, uh, then we'll invite Chris Rose up. Hi, I'm Chloe Scott. I'm Caperton Henderson. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm William. Diversity matters to me because as a woman after the fall of Roe, a decision made by a majority male court, I wish to live in a world where women in government positions get to decide what happens to our bodies. Because as an African American, I want to see a community as diverse as Hillbrook reflected when we look at the rest of the world. Because it provides productivity, innovation, and employee retention, making society a better place. Because as someone who is adopted and unsure of their own ethnicity, I hope for everyone to see others like themselves when they look at the government. Imagine what it means to everybody else out there. We do believe that diversity throughout the country, in terms of age, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of gender, enriches our understanding of the challenges that face us and help us be prepared to meet those challenges. That's why diversity is important in government as well as in business and in civic societies. What is being done right now? What have we learned? Cindy Chavez's chief of staff, Betty Young, was a key creator of VASC, or the Vietnamese American Service Center, to help address social and health disparities in their community, which is a place for Vietnamese Americans to get any kind of help they need. 
The program stemmed from a study done on liver cancer, where Vietnamese populations were disproportionately affected by the disease because people were scared to go to hospitals where doctors couldn't speak English. Betty's work is derived from the fact that her parents are Vietnamese refugees. We tried to get an interview with people benefiting from VASC services, but limited numbers spoke English, which actually helps us explain how imperative places like VASC are. Betty says that she wants to replicate the model but add key changes, because in her own words, when things change, we pivot. Many things have changed in the city. According to Robert Wright, a man who used to work on the United Farmer Farm Workers Boycott Office with Cesar Chavez, the city has become more and more racially diverse. Immigrant-run businesses and small businesses are becoming more and more common. Diversity in businesses is just as important as civics Healthy and vibrant culture in the city benefits everyone. The population of San Jose is heavily diverse, and majority people of color. Specifically, the Asian American community, and a very large Vietnamese and Japanese population, and Latinx community. 37.5% of people in San Jose in the 2022 census were Asian, and 31.1% were Latinx. We are coming up on a controversial presidential election, and with some candidates perpetuating hateful ideologies and other candidates fighting to break barriers, it is vital to highlight and hold up the voices of our politicians who will represent the unique voices of the people. In short, we've gone through a very stagnant period in time where the people in charge have stayed in charge. If we don't take action now, when will we? How do the diverse groups and populations in San Jose reflect the way that the city runs? It makes it more welcoming for everyone. It creates community. It can influence art and food. Unique voices amplify unique issues. To know what matters to everyone. All right, well, um, I want to introduce Chris Rose, one of our parents, but also an expert and a mentor during um, during the immersive process. And, and before kind of asking a couple of questions about what it was like being a mentor and an expert during that, Chris, I, I, I thought because making a decision around high school really is a family decision, um, you could go back a year in time and talk about, you know, what was it for you? How did you go about making the decision for Jackson and for your family? And, and why eventually did you make a decision around Hillbrook? Yeah, sure. So for our family, it was really important that um, we find a school that that helped tie the purpose in learning back to actual learning, as in meaning you're not just learning um, math to do math and to do problems over and over and to get whatever score you get. You're using this to an end. And um, that was, it was evident right away that that was um, going to be core to the school. Uh, we had come from schools like that. We were very interested. Um, I, I knew you well by reputation um, and was thrilled that you would be leading this school. And um, every second of the last, uh, really of the last year has been um, a phenomenal journey with you. Um, and one more question, just maybe, maybe, um give some insights or, or uh, some suggestions to families as they go through the process. Um, what would you recommend that families look for as they sort of dig into schools? What, what questions should they ask? What, should, what would you recommend as a focal point? I, I think that a lot of the schools are talking about the same kinds of things. They're talking about student-centered learning. They're talking about making sure that the kids are passionate about their learning. But I think you need to go deeper. Um, for us, it was also about are you learning um, solely for your own benefit? Which, of course, learning for your own benefit is essential. But are you also learning to be part of a community, to be part of a society, to be part of all of the people that are trying to make a change and a difference in the world? And if you do not start these skills early, it, you just don't have enough time to practice. And the, you know, the sooner we practice those skills, the, the better we are. And, and one of those skills, Chris, um, and, and one of the lenses of the Scott Center is around storytelling. And one of the reasons why we wanted to ask you to come and be one of our expert and mentors during the immersives is your experience um, uh, as, a, as a professional storyteller. So can you share with folks a little bit about your um, work prior to, prior to now? Sure. 
Um, I majored in journalism. I was, I right out of college went to work for NBC Nightly News, Meet the Press, and uh, stayed there for the first half of my career. And then after having kids, I was really, really interested um, in how they learned and how they would progress in life and became, um, I transitioned in education, education entrepreneurship um, and built products around um, creation and collaboration and um, project-based learning. So that kind of learning um, for not just for the sake of learning, but for an end, which is really what we're all doing every day. Um, that was essential to me. Yeah, it's, it was it, it really important for us as we thought about sort of surrounding our students with mentors um, to have them uh, see a diverse range of skills and interests. Uh, and, and having you be part of the immersives was so remarkable. A highlight for me um, was on one of the last nights when when Caperton's group um, was, was coming together to finish their um, diversity in politics video that we just saw. Uh, and I walked in uh, and I walked into a room and it was about seven o'clock at night. We were having our impact-a-thon just to make sure that kids were ready. And there you were against the wall and one student was in front of a computer, uh, you know, doing some editing and two other students were in conversation about what what to make. Um, and, and after that moment, I said, was that sort of like the work that you were doing in industry? Um, can you share a little bit about your response? Yes, I said that is exactly what one would do it in, in industry. I mean, we're a producer sits in the room with an editor, you see a big screen up on the wall, you talk about uh, what it is that you need in the piece. But but the thing that I think I said to you that night was what actually was even more impactful to me was to be out in the field. So a lot of the footage that you just saw, um, I was able to to be present with the the learners as they were doing interviews, it was exactly like you would do in a local news um, story. They were it, doing interviews with people that were um, on the ground. They were learning about, and, and, and I was as well. So, you know, it is impactful to the mentor, the parent, um, whoever it is that is alongside these learners to see that, that they can make these um, instant uh, impacts. I mean, it was impactful to me. It was impactful to them. I could guide them in ways that you could never do in a classroom. You can't do it in a textbook. You can't do it online. I mean, you're right there with them saying, hey, you might think about framing the question this way. You might think about getting a different angle so that you can show your viewer a, a broader view. You might try a, a variety of different things. And those, those were elements that you would never be able to do unless you were out in the field with these learners. And the other the other thing that was fantastic is they had so much content that they now have many additional stories that they could take and create with this. And they were they they were so excited in the field to see what they were doing and how much of a difference it would ultimately make. And they're like, well, wow, is this what professionals do? And I said, yes, it is. You're doing it right now. One of the things you just described, Chris, perfectly captures progressive education, which is that we learn by doing. Um, but I would extend that a little bit farther. And it, it, it's not just that we learn by doing, we learn by doing and then reflecting upon it. Uh, and while we were had the chance to show um, this final product to all of you, it was the it was the reflection on process along the way that drove the deeper learning. Um, and can you speak to like a, a moment where it was that that moment of sort of reflecting on where they were that was allowed to catalyze them to to, to vastly improve their final product? Yeah, I mean, there were. This was not. It's not an easy process to just meet your peers and come together and and organize. And these kids all did this in different ways. They all self organized. Either you know, they they. It, it just was. There's. It's all self correcting. There is no way that they. Um, you have to figure things out in the moment. And there was a time where they they did not think they were going to be ready by the next morning, and they pulled a whole bunch of different things together and they advocated for themselves. They said, oh, is there any way that we can do this? And the adults in the room said, yes, yes, let's find a way. So we went out in the field and got them the footage, but they they were the ones that advocated. They were the ones that realized that they needed additional support and they made it happen. Well, I, I'm so grateful to have you not only participate as one of our experts and mentors during the immersives, but also being one of our founding families and, and a grade level parent as well. Um, so I, I want to bring um, bring back Annie onto the uh, onto the screen, and because um, what we're talking about is learning that is um, 
not just deeply purposeful, but also will prepare students um, for for their future, for what's for what lies ahead. Um, can so can you talk to us a little bit about the research that you were just looking at? Yes, absolutely. One of my uh, the joys of my job is that it has allowed me to have time and spaces where people are thinking really thoughtfully about the future of education. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a dinner with the with the president of USC and her opening remarks to this panel um, of folks that were really curious about how she thought higher education was going to change. Um, was that she doesn't actually have very many answers for that question yet, but it's an important question. What she did have an answer to was the fact that at USC and in higher education and in companies, so both in college and beyond, what we are hearing time and time again is that people want change makers and entrepreneurial thinkers as part of their communities. And Carol was so clear about the critical nature of having that mindset when you get to college to make the most of it both your four years or six years, whatever it looks like for you, your learning journey, but also for that additional post-college life where you're really engaging deeply in your career. And, and that's really what we believe social impact is, purpose and preparation for the life that will give you meaning and agency. And as we talk about developing change makers, um, what better opportunity than to study social entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley, the place of entrepreneurship at a school, Hillbrook School, that focuses deeply on social entrepreneurship with its Scott Center. Um, and then additionally is in this entrepreneurial moment uh, where we are, where we see the next four years of classes as being part of our founding classes of helping us to build a school, to build traditions, to build programs. Uh, and if you're someone who's always asking that question, what if school could be like this? Or how might we do that to make school even more exciting and relevant and meaningful? Um, this is a school for you. And if you want to learn more about that, um, Marisol can share some of the upcoming admissions events. Yeah, hi. As I mentioned earlier, this is the second virtual webinar of a series that we'll offer for your family for the upper school. There's a list of future admission events that we have scheduled, and Immersive is the one that we have tonight. And if you're interested in learning about our academic program, you can also view the recorded webinar on our Hillbrook's YouTube channel. We highly encourage you to attend the upcoming webinars and I hope to see you at one of our two open houses and there's still time to register for our second open house in November. If your family is unable to attend one of our events, please reach out to the admissions office directly and registrations for all of these events are on Ravenna in the same step as our virtual sessions. And here are some of the admission key dates and to note for our process for our academic year. As a reminder, Hillbrook does not require you to submit an application for you to sign up and come for a visit day. So your family has plenty of time to submit uh, your application. Additionally, if for any reason you're having difficulty getting school records or any teacher recommendations, please contact us directly at admissions at hillbrooks.org and we can figure out how to best support you in your application. Right. Well, thank you. That wraps up our formal program to her tonight's events. We'll spend the next five, 10 minutes or so answering questions from our Q&A. So we'll bring up everybody back to the screen so we can have a little bit of a conversation. Thank you. And Marisol, the first question is, is for you. Um, which is, will you be hold, Will we be holding shadow days for students? Can you talk a little bit about the way in which we're doing that? Yes, absolutely. So we are holding shadow days between October and January, and they the students will have an ability to shadow the student for the first half of the day, and then we will be having some form of a collaborative design challenge experience. So we're really excited for any of you to come visit. You don't have to submit the application, as I said before, but you will be able to um, engage with some of the students and then we'll have some really cool stuff in the afternoon to do. So uh, all of those different uh, dates are on Ravenna and we hope to see you at the upper school. Let's see what we got here. Oh, and then let's see. Um, are there additional costs associated with the immersive 
programs. Annie or Mike, would you like to take that question? Sure. We um, so tuition covers some of the uh, immersive programs. Um, there will be um, some additional costs for the larger travel trips, um, but tuition covers a big piece of that as well. Um, and and we'll make sure to share those with families um, throughout the process. All right. Awesome. Let's see. And uh, any more questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And we've really enjoyed. Oh, let's see. Something else coming. Let's see. Oh. Okay. So it looks like if you're interested in joining us for our conversations for good, yes. Our last note before we leave is a uh, guest on November 3rd. We have put the information here in the comment section if you would like to sign up. Oh, look. We have some. Oh, will the immersives change next year? Next question. Yeah. Um, Mike, would you like to answer that question? So our, our ninth grade immersives will follow the same sort of um, model of, of having a focus on social impact with the fall being focused on San Jose um, and then the spring focused on around the world. We, we are, it is our intention, um, and this is just best practice around community engagement and partnership to have ongoing enduring relationships with the places that we go so that we can um, build relationships within the community. So I, we expect that we will continue to have courses that run um, to Argentina, to Alaska, um, to Colorado. Um, but as we both grow up in terms of adding grade levels, but also grow out, we'll be adding courses um, within those um, within those domains. And of course, um, you know, as we build out the 10th grade, we'll be building out those courses. Annie shared some of those. Um, but as is the case, you know, for our founding students, and for the next, as I mentioned, for the next couple of years, who will be the founding students, we'll be working closely with students to determine what are the things that they want to do? And how do we build courses around the things the world the things in the world that we should be exploring the interests of our kids and the expertise of our faculty? Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And any questions you have, please contact admissions at hillbrook.org and sign up for some shadow days. And we have our open houses coming up and have a wonderful night, everyone.